What's up, everybody? Welcome to our squad. If we have not yet met, if we have not yet met, my name is Jordan. I have the honor of leading this right here, which is really exciting. So whatever location you're at, whenever you're watching this video, I wanna welcome you. Thank you so much for being here today. We have been in a pretty exciting series for the past few weeks, all about mental health. Now, mental health is a hugely complex category, obviously in video style teaching. We're not really able to hit on every single little particular thing, but we're trying to do our best to encompass sort of the entire conversation and do it justice. Week one, we sort of laid the foundation for how we were going to be approaching this issue. And the way we're doing that is a very holistic process. We've been talking about taking care of our bodies, taking care of our souls, taking care of our spirits. And we believe that when those things are all working together in unison, that leads to health, not just mentally, but holistically. And then last week was week two where we talked about perspective. Perspective is huge. The way that we view our problems, the way that we see our challenges and obstacles in our life is huge to the conversation of mental health and really just staying healthy and thinking well about things in general. As followers of Jesus, we wanna be people who think well about things. We wanna see our problems for what they really are not for what we've worked them up and made them to be. Now, next week, we're gonna be concluding the mental health series. I actually have the opportunity of sitting down with a professional counselor, and she's gonna be giving us some really interesting insights into the work that she does, what she's seeing kind of happening with middle and high school students across the broader spectrum as far as mental health and all that stuff is concerned. So you're gonna to wanna to come back for that conversation. It's gonna be a really important one. But tonight, I want to finish our teaching on mental health, talking a little bit about guilt and shame. I know that so far, as we've been talking about mental health in general, you know, that's a pretty big concept and term and there's a lot of things that can fall into that category. Extremely high levels of stress, anxiety, excessive worrying, depression. I mean, like there's so many things that fall into that category. And maybe you've been watching these videos and you're like, I don't really struggle with that a whole lot. I have not really had a lot of experiences with that. I haven't really dealt with that. Maybe you know other people that have. And what I want us to understand today is Although we've sort of titled this collection of messages mental health, what we're talking about today and what we've been talking about for the past few weeks applies to every single one of us. Having a right perspective doesn't just apply to people with anxiety, that applies for everybody across the board. Taking care of spirit, body, and soul, that's for everybody. And as we're gonna talk about today, dealing with guilt and shame in the proper and wise way is absolutely critical for anyone who is following Jesus, no matter you know whether you've dealt with mental health issues or not, is of absolute most importance. And so I just want to make sure before we go any further that we don't check out if we're not personally impacted by the things that we're dealing with. Chances are you've made a mistake before or you've done something wrong and you've battled a little bit of guilt and shame. Also, final reminder, our squad live is this Sunday. 6 30 to 8 p.m. at the renovation offices. We got a giveaway going on on Instagram right now, so make sure you check that out. We got ways for you to invite your friends physically through the cards. I don't have one right here, but I still got that sticker over there on my wall. We're gonna be handing out those that night as well. We're expecting to have over 100 middle and high school students join us for this night. You do not want to miss it. It's been a long time since we've brought everybody together. I believe there's no better way to kickstart your summer in 2021. So make plans to join us this Sunday. If you don't have a ride, find a ride or ask a leader for a ride or ask one of your friends for a ride. Let's make it happen. We'll see you May 16th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. All right, enough of that. Let's talk about guilt and shame. Guilt and shame affects everyone. As we talk about this a little bit more in this video, you're gonna see specifically how it relates to the mental health conversation. But as I stated at the beginning of this video, this is something that every single person has faced, is facing, 
or will face in the future. And shame, I believe, is one of the greatest hurdles that we have to get over in order to stay healthy, in order to stay on the right track in following Jesus. Genesis chapter 3, we're taking it way back. The beginning of Genesis chapter 3, we're, we're only in the third chapter of the Bible, and the serpent has approached Adam and Eve to tempt them and to try to convince them to disobey the one rule that God gave them, to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, a few verses into chapter 3, we already see they've been convinced. Adam and Eve give in, they take the fruit, they take a big old bite, and then let's look at verse 7. At that moment, at that very moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Adam and Eve have been walking around in the Garden of Eden. Everything's perfect. Everything's amazing. And they actually don't even have clothes on because it wasn't that big of a deal. They weren't embarrassed. They weren't experiencing shame. It's not until they disobey God. It's not until they sin and miss the mark and go against God's plan and design that their eyes are opened immediately and they experience shame. This next verse is crazy. Verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. That's a pretty cool image. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Adam and Eve have experienced shame. And then what's their immediate reaction after that feeling of shame? They hide. Then the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Now, as we stated last week, God approached Elijah and asked him a question. And God didn't ask Elijah a question because God didn't know the answer. He asked Elijah a question because he wanted to see if Elijah knew the answer. So now we have God asking Adam a question. Where are you? This isn't because God doesn't know where Adam is. Of course, God knows where Adam is. God asked Adam a question because he wanted to see if Adam knew what had really happened, if he was going to be honest with him and really identify the problem. You know, after this happens, Adam is afraid. He's a little discombobulated. He sort of starts to lose himself a little bit. He starts blaming other people. He goes into hiding. And I think that a lot of us can relate. That's what happens when we are not only dealing with anxiety and mental health issues, but that's just in life. When we disobey, when we do something that somebody told us not to do, and we go on that path for a little while, we start to just get, we, we start to lose ourselves a little bit. We start to just get caught up in the mess or in the lie or in the fear, and we kind of just get backed up against the wall and we don't really know where to go or what to do or how to get out of it. Adam is afraid because shame has now entered into the equation. Shame is the result of sin. Shame is the result of us disobeying and breaking relationship with God. Shame happens because we choose to do our own thing and we choose to go against God's plan and design. And so shame enters into the picture here the moment that Adam and Eve choose to break relationship and trust with God. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between guilt and shame, because these are both words that we hear a lot in culture. Guilt, when someone's guilty, when someone commits a crime or when someone is suspected to have committed a crime, we have jury and there's the trial and then ultimately we get the verdict, like what have the people and the judge and the jury decided? If they believe that someone has committed that crime, they are found guilty. Guilty essentially just means this person did something wrong. They did something bad and they got caught and they're going to be responsible for that. They're guilty. We've all been guilty of certain things, of lying, of cheating, of disobeying our parents, right? There's so many things that we've been guilty for going over the speed limit. But shame is even worse and shame creeps in. Whenever we've done something wrong, we're guilty, but then shame sort of attaches that problem to our identity. And so in the case of guilty, which says you did something wrong, shame says something's wrong with you. It's not just that you did something, it's that you are something. You didn't do something bad. Shame says 
you are bad. And so Adam experiences this overwhelming sense of there is something wrong with me. I did something wrong, but there's something wrong with me. And he immediately hides. I think every single one of us can relate to being in a position where we've done something wrong, but the more we thought about it or the more that we were punished by that, or maybe we did something wrong again, and then we get it again and again and again, and we just kind of spiral downward on this path that we just don't want to go down, but we don't know how to stop. What happens? Well, we do what Adam did. We usually hide. We usually run into hiding. Adam went into isolation. He tried to hide from God. He tried to hide from the problems because he was embarrassed. He was afraid. He was fearful. Now, I want us to understand something really important right here. Isolation and going into hiding is never the answer to dealing with mental health issues. It's never the answer to dealing with brokenness. It's never the answer to dealing with sin. And I believe that shame, if it's not handled well, and if it's not taken care of, this can even become more debilitating than the anxiety that we battle. This thing right here can become even more harmful than any of the individual challenges or sins that we have because shame becomes this thing that sort of just sits over us. It's like this dark cloud that just follows us around everywhere that we go. I love this verse in Proverbs 18 verse 1. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Three things that I see from this verse that I believe we can all, every single one of us can apply to our lives that deal with battling against shame. There are three responses that we have to shame that we can see in this verse right here. And number one is we go into hiding. The first section of this verse right here says that a man who isolates himself so this isn't somebody being forced into isolation, right? Or being told to go to a certain place to deal with their stuff. No, this says a man or a woman who isolates themselves. That means that a lot of us, our first reaction to dealing with shame is remove ourselves from the situation. We just withdraw. We step back from the things that we're involved in. And that can be in two major ways. That can be emotionally. That can be, you know, putting up those walls, lying to people about how we're actually doing, suppressing our feelings, not telling anybody what's actually going on on the inside of us. That's a form of hiding. And then number two can be physically. We physically start to disappear from situations, from social gatherings, from hanging out with our friends, from going to school. We we just start to come up with all of these excuses as to why we can't be certain places or be around other people. And we start living in this denial of, hey, how you doing? Fine. You're not really doing fine. Hey, how are things going all right? Yeah, everything's good, but things aren't really good. Number two, the verse says that the person who isolates themselves seeks their own desire. What does that mean? It means they stop listening. Look, chances are, if you're battling some anxiety or depression, if you feel just a little discombobulated by the stresses and fears of life, if you've just been on a little bit of a string of disobedience and going after the things you want to and kind of leaving a little bit of wreckage behind you, chances are the people in your life who are close to you have a little bit of an idea of what's going on. All right. I think sometimes we think we're a little more sneaky or that we keep things more secretive and than we really do. I know there were times when I was in high school and I was out doing stupid stuff and people knew. Like I thought, man, I thought I was getting away with everything. I wasn't. Chances are the people close to you have a little bit of an inkling or a suspicion of what's going on. And when we seek our own desire, we push the people away that we should be pulling in. When we seek our own desire, we essentially try to deal with all of our problems on our own. We think that we're going to be able to fix ourselves. So we push people away. We stop listening to the wisdom and advice and counsel of the people around us who know us best. And number three, our verse says, a man who isolates himself and seeks his own desire goes against all wise judgment. I love the book of Proverbs because the entire book 
essentially creates this picture of what does wisdom look like and what does foolishness look like. And so right here, Proverbs is making a wisdom statement saying, if you want to be wise, don't do this. Don't isolate yourself. Don't seek your own desire because that goes against everything that wisdom is about. And so the third thing I want to bring to you, I, don't, I didn't, couldn't really think of like a, you know, nicer way to say this. So I'll just say it. What happens when we isolate ourselves and when we seek our own desire? We do stupid stuff. Write that in your notes. We do stupid stuff. We start making bad decisions. We start getting involved with bad relationships. We start compromising on values and integrity. And all of a sudden, things last year we said, I'm never going to do that. You're doing it. We just do dumb stuff. When we isolate ourselves, scripture says we seek our own desire. We try to deal with and handle all of our problems on our own. Newsflash, if you've ever read the Bible, that's not the way this works. That's the whole reason we have the person of Jesus who did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He provided salvation. He provided redemption through grace. The entire bottom line of life with Jesus Jesus is that we can't save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do that can overcome the fact that we're guilty. And so Jesus paid the price and did what we could never do. Let's talk about some final things here. Shame is a very serious challenge. It's, it's a very serious issue. And hopefully along the way, you can see how the mental health issue and shame can kind of go hand in hand. We get caught up in these traps in feeling a certain way. We feel all out of whack, like we've lost purpose and we've lost a little bit of hope. And then shame comes in, this tactic of the devil to come alongside and attach itself to that to say, yeah, and guess what? This is who you are. This is who you're always going to be. You're never going to be able to escape from this. And we get caught up in shame and we go into hiding. That's the, that's the recipe. That's the cycle. That's the process that a lot of us can find ourselves in. And it's not just mental health issues. It's all types of sins and disobedience and just temptations and struggles that we face in life. We're always going to be tempted to devalue ourselves and we fall prey to one of the greatest sources of confusion that the enemy has. Jesus is the greatest friend that there is. He's the greatest friend that there is. He's the greatest cure for all of the things that we're battling with and dealing with on the inside of us. And I just want you to know today that God knows what has happened. God knows everything you've done. Just at the beginning when he asks Adam, where are you? God already knows where you are. He knows what's happened. He knows what you've done. He knows what's happened to you. He knows what's been done to you. Our squad, let's be a community who understands and believes and constantly confesses that what we've done is not who we are. That depression is not who we are. That fear is not who we are. That disobedience and sin and nastiness and betrayal and cheating and lying it's not who we are. They may be things that we've done, but it's not who we are. And may we be a community that does not isolate ourselves, that does not seek our own desires, but that falls back into the loving arms of God whenever we feel guilty, whenever we feel embarrassed, whenever we feel shame, whenever we feel like we're not good enough because God loves us still the same. And today he is calling you and he is calling me. He is calling all of us to come out of hiding.